This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. Chapter 5 deals with the structure of businesses, business change, the value chain, and the McKinsey 7S model. First of all, why uh, is the structure of a business uh, in a paper which is called Performance Management? Uh, and it's there because the, the way a business is structured is going to determine the way it is managed. It's going to uh, determine uh, to whom various people report. Uh, it is going to d determine uh, how uh, different divisions or departments are perhaps going to be judged and managed in a way that is going to maximize the overall company performance. The first structure we deal with here is what's called the functional structure. This is uh, the simplest structure and most businesses, as soon as they begin to get any size at all, begin to evolve into this sort of a structure. Uh, and basically you have it arranged uh, because each function uh, has got a whole department. So you have the finance function, it has the finance department, the manufacturing department, the sales department and so on. Advantages of this structure, well, you tend to get considerable economies of scale. All the financial transactions go through one department. Uh, they gain uh, considerable expertise there. You can uh, afford to, to pay a well-qualified person to be the head of each of these departments and so on. Uh, secondly, the people within each department uh, feel fairly comfortable. You're dealing with uh, colleagues who are from similar backgrounds and you talk the same language. Why, therefore, would we ever depart from this functional structure? And really that happens as the, the business begins to get larger and larger and larger, and really two things begin to, to happen. Uh, first of all, the heads of each of the department, once you are maybe, say, in manufacturing, looking after perhaps uh, 2,000 employees in a very large factory, uh, you are an important person, uh, and sometimes uh, the power goes to your head, and uh, you can become a bit uncooperative with people in other departments. So you could uh, almost imagine a scenario where somebody from sales comes through to the manufacturing department, says we have this fantastic order coming in, uh, we want you to perhaps interrupt, if you could, your production schedule, so that we can accommodate the order coming from this very important customer. And the manufacturing director says no, uh, because the manufacturing director sees if the production line is stopped and uh, set up for the new order, there are going to be all sorts of adverse variances that are going to have to be explained away. So the manufacturing director or manager begins looking after his or her own interests rather than seeing that the manufacturing department is is one of the many departments in the organization and it is organizational success which matters. Secondly, as businesses uh, grow, there is inevitably uh, a degree of diversification. Now, by this I don't mean going into radically different businesses, uh, but you would have sales in Europe and sales in North America and perhaps sales in Asia. But the, uh, the the markets faced in those three areas are very different. There'd be different competitors, uh, different pricing, different ways of advertising. They may require slightly different products. There may be uh, different legal uh, frameworks uh, that they have to comply with as well. And if you try to, 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 to ram all of this together, just having one sales department, one manufacturing department, one finance department, it's probably not going to work very well. You're probably going to get more success really coming from specialization. Your North American division, the people there know what the North American market wants, knows the laws and regulations governing the products which they're producing, knows the competition, uh, and gets to know their customers very well. Similarly in the European and the Asian market. So once uh, the uh, business grows, it, it, it can then become divisionalized, uh, essentially by 
uh, geography. Uh, well, that's one of the ways in which can it, it can it can it can happen. So there we have it's uh, two divisions: uh, finance, manufacturing, R and D, sales, in each of these divisions, and so on. Alternatively, it could be divisionalized by major product line. So we use of one very large chemical uh, company in the UK, and essentially it made two types of product. One was paint, and the other was agricultural chemicals. And really there was nothing in common between the manufacturing, the customers, the suppliers, and it made no sense at all to, to, to bring them together. Once you have divisionalized, it also opens up the way uh, to allow you to compare how each of the divisions is going. Uh, it gives you almost a benchmark, an internal benchmark, and you can almost have a competitive environment going on to see which of the divisions is making best use for its capital and so on. The problems with uh, divisionalized structures, is, first of all, you can get a certain duplication of effort. You maybe have now two finance departments, two IT departments and so on. Uh, secondly, it requires a degree of coordination. Uh, you don't want the North American division and the European, div European division both perhaps trying to win a contract from an international client. You have to make sure they're not competing, competing against each other. And sometimes if the divisions are based kind of on product, that Division A makes the components and Division B assembles those components and sends, sends them all on, so the components are going from Division A to Division B, then it, uh, it gives you transfer pricing problems, which is a whole area that we're going to have to look at later on. But divisional structures for large organizations are almost universal. The next structure we have is a matrix structure. Uh, this is very uh, common in contract uh, work. Uh, so we could have projects or contracts, uh, contract A, contract B, contract C, uh, going down uh, the, uh, the, 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 the side here. Uh, each of these contracts or projects would have a project manager. And you ne need a mix of skills to, to run that contract or project. So here we have a person uh, who has been assigned to uh, Project B or Contract B uh, and who is going to be reporting to the contract manager in B. Uh, but this person also have a, a, a kind of technical discipline. This is a quality control person uh, and will have to report to the quality control manager. The claimed disadvantage of the matrix structure uh, is that it is going to put this person perhaps under a, uh, quite a bit of competing pressure sometimes. It, and, and some people say that's not fair. Let's say that uh, Project B was going behind time. What the Project B manager could say uh, to this uh, person, they could say, well, we need to speed up. I would like you to drop uh, some of the quality control tests. Uh, but the uh, a quality control manager says, no, 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 you mustn't drop those tests. We want to make sure that the uh, the project is completed safely and that the specification and so on. So here we have, in a way, two managers uh, uh, putting competing pressure uh, onto this poor person here. And some management theory says it's, it's, it's wrong to have two bosses shouting at you. I think one boss shouting at you is quite enough. My own view is that this doesn't create these type of uh, conflicts. Uh, I think even if it wasn't set out in a matrix structure that, that you uh, rarely just are reporting to one person, you have got a, a number of different responsibilities uh, uh, within organizations. And I think in a way, depicting it on a matrix structure actually brings it out into the open. Uh, if you were this person here, this, this junior person, Really, the wrong way for you to make the decision uh, is to listen to the boss who shouts louder or, or, or listen to the boss who is more intimidating. That is no way to make a proper decision. And here you are. You are the most junior person out of these three. Why is it uh, being forced on you to make the decision as to whether or not you should let the project go late or whether or not you should leave out some of the quality controls. 
Could you not say to these people, like, look, I'm reporting to you, I'm reporting to you. You are the two most senior people here. You are the managers. Why don't you two cooperate? Why don't you two get together and discuss what needs to be done? So it should enforce cooperation. What we want is a win-win. We want the project to be done on time and we want the project to be done safely and to the right quality standards. And it might be that these two more skilled, more experienced people know a way in which that could be done, perhaps by dropping one or two of the tests or postponing them to do them later and so on. And then when they've got to the solution, uh, they can tell this quality control person what to do. Disadvantages in this, uh, the main disadvantage probably, is this person might not really know uh, who, who, the, who their main boss is. If you can't get agreement between these two here, which one should they should they listen to? Uh, but again, I'm not sure that this is something which is actually caused by being more realistic about the structure of the responsibilities within the organisation. Finally, on uh, structures, uh, a modern structure is a so-called network or virtual organisation. Uh, and really what the company does here is it outsources as much as it can uh, and all it keeps is uh, its core company uh, and all it retains is, is its core activities, what it does that it is almost uniquely good at. And it will uh, subcontract out here, could subcontract for example uh, its accounting department, it could subcontract people to look after its IT. It will almost certainly subcontract its legal services, subcontract the human resources and, uh, and the like. It will even often uh, subcontract manufacturing. So uh, a supplier here is not just a supplier of components, it's uh, a potentially a supplier which actually manufactures the finished goods. Uh, and what this company does, it will have perhaps a website, uh, the customers come on the website, uh, the company uh, gets in touch with its subcontracting manufacturers and the goods will actually go directly from the uh, supplier to the customers. So, so this company is kind of sitting in the middle of a web organising stuff. Uh, what it would mean is if you looked at the company's financial statements it could have a very large turnover, but really quite a small balance sheet because it will have had no real manufacturing facilities at all. Everything is, is going to be subcontracted out. This is, uh, to some extent, quite fashionable at the, at the moment. The idea really at the moment is you concentrate on what you're really good at, where you can uniquely add value, where you are uniquely better than your competitors. In other words, you have competitive advantage. And you get rid of all the other stuff because you're not making money out of you know, recording your financial accounts, running your IT, running your human resources. You're not even making money out of manufacturing. You might be making money out of design. And it's your clever designs that you get a, 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 a really well set up manufacturer to make very efficiently, perhaps in a, a low cost area of the world. That's the best way to make profits. One of the uh, trends we just mentioned very uh, quickly here, really starting in the 90s and the 2000s here, is a move from the uh, tall narrow uh, into the wide flat. Uh, this movement here really was something which uh, took place, as I say, around the 1990s and the 2000s. Companies uh, uh, had deliberate delayering and flattening strategies uh, because they were convinced that the tall narrow structure, which is really quite an old-fashioned bureaucratic structure, uh, was not good at improving their performance. What drove this change? Well, a couple of things. First of all, there was increasing cost pressure. It was in the 1990s and 2000s that many 
manufacturers in the Far East uh, began becoming really very important, and they had very low cost bases. And companies began thinking about these people here, these middle managers, thinking, what are these people actually doing? You have got senior managers who are managing managers, who are managing senior supervisors, who are managing supervisors, who are managing assistant supervisors. Uh, and all of this uh, kind of supervision which was going on, uh, could, could, it's probably a luxury they couldn't afford and was probably something that wasn't necessary. So one thing uh, that drove, drove this was the cost reduction. The second thing which drove it, uh, really in the 1990s and 2000s, uh, technology began to move much, much faster. Uh, whereas back, uh, you, if you go back even to, to the 80s, 70s, uh, a company would make one product and it would really keep making that product for several years. Uh, now not many companies are not going to have a product launch at least every year. Uh, and, and we need to also keep up to date with technological changes. And what was happening here uh, was that it was terribly slow to react. So, so perhaps the person at the bottom, a new graduate coming in uh, with new information about IT, how important uh, Twitter or Facebook is, the, the, these kind of social networks were in marketing, uh, tells this person, tells them, etc. And it goes up here from manager to manager to manager, uh, each jump slowing it down, each jump probably distorting the message very slightly, and then it would have to kind of come down here. And by the time it went up and went down, uh, the people at the top, uh, etc., would be, would be really making decisions uh, which may have been based on distorted information, but which were far too slow. With this wide, flat uh, organization here, uh, then the distance between top and bottom is much less. They're much more egalitarian. You would be much more likely to actually see uh, the chief executive officer in an organization with only four layers than, than you would be in an organization with, with 20 layers. So they, uh, an essential way of improving performance was to keep up to date, to get quick communication, and to be flexible, to react to the market, to react what, competi what competitors are, are doing, and so on. So moving from tall, narrow to wide, flat is essentially uh, what many businesses have, 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 have tried very hard to do. There are certain implications of that. Uh, on the tall, narrow, uh, if each manager was looking after only two people here, you could nearly duplicate their work. Uh, you didn't have to be a very good manager, very good delegator. These people didn't actually have to be very good at their jobs because they're going to be uh, checked up on very closely. But if you're looking after, say, 20 people or 10 people here, you cannot uh, re-perform 20 people's work. You have to be a better manager to, de to delegate properly to these people. And these people probably have to be better employees because they're going to be working more on their own. They might enjoy it, but they, they also need better training uh, and, and, and also better uh, access to information. Again, it tended to be that information was often kind of conserved at the top of organizations who made the decisions, which then kind of trickled down to the organizations. Uh, if you are delegating to more and more people, then you have to match that delegation with a change in who has access to information, because you need information, the right information, to make decisions. Decentralization and centralization uh, kind of goes with uh, the, the, the kind of structures we've got uh, here. But this is to do with how much power you, 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 you put down. If I went back to this, the, the, the structure here is not telling us whether this person uh, has got kind of authority to buy something for only $100 or has got authority maybe to uh, sign off on an order for $10,000. So there's a slight difference between the shape of the organization uh, and how much power trickles down. And decentralization really looks at how much power trickles down. And again, this can be very, very important to improve the profits and performance of an organization. 
look at all the uh, good things that come from decentralization. First of all, top managers have got time to concentrate on the top decision. You don't want the top manager's time to be taken up with deciding what sort of coffee machine they should get uh, when they also have to decide should I open in Europe or not. So it clears the desk, if you like, leaves top managers with just top decisions, gets rid of the, 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 the more basic decisions to people further on down the organization. Second, you're probably going to get better decisions. They're going to be faster. The person in South America can react quickly to marketing forces in South America, perhaps to, to put on a promotional campaign to deal with some local competition. It's probably going to be about uh, decentralization will also uh, probably delegate to functional experts. I come from an accounting background. Uh, there's little point in asking me to make decisions if I was the CEO. Little point in asking me to make decisions about uh, where the advertising should be, be taking place. Really, the person who knows about advertising is the advertising manager. Uh, so, so let the advertising manager make the better decision. And again, geographically, uh, the, the, the person who knows about the, you know, the Brazilian market, let, let that person who is an expert in that market make those decisions. It motivates staff. Uh, people get a huge job satisfaction from being put in charge of stuff and then you know, solving little problems. And then if it goes well uh, and they can be praised for uh, making the right decision and running the department well, it's hugely motivational. Good people will not stay if uh, all they have to do is to do what they're told rather than be given responsibility. Finally, a training and assessment of staff. If you don't uh, allow anyone to make decisions, who do you know is going to be good at making decisions? Who are you going to uh, uh, promote? The disadvantage, the major disadvantage, is, is a possible poor coordination or dysfunctional decision making, where one division makes a decision uh, which is going to harm another division and which overall means the group loses out. The worst example I ever had of this was a, a company which had grown quite quickly by acquisition. Uh, many people within the company didn't quite know uh, the name of all the group companies. And we had one uh, company based in the UK, uh, another company based in America, part of the same group, and they began bidding for the same contract. And they didn't know they were part of the same group, and they just bid against each other, bringing the price down and so on. So you need some coordination, and we'll see when we get on to transfer pricing, that wrong transfer prices is one area where the uh, it, it needs to be perhaps coordinated from, 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 from the top. And now we come on to business process change. The first slide we don't need to spend very long on. It's really saying there are kind of three degrees of change, three amounts of kind of seriousness of change. First of all, you can have automation. That's just doing by computer what used to be done manually. And we've seen this in wages and salaries. We've seen it in looking after the receivables, that ledger, and so on. We've seen it in perhaps placing orders. So for many years, uh, in a supermarket, they, 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 they scan the, the goods as you leave the supermarket. Uh, the uh, inventory records are updated. And when the inventory falls to reorder level, uh, then you can alert uh, managers or perhaps the computer system itself is going to place an order to replenish those goods. Rationalization is taking, uh, going a little bit further, it, it's removing bottlenecks, removing inefficiencies which are there. Uh, and I will say here, let's, let's take this place order one here. We thought that was going pretty well. Uh, automatically keeping track of the stock and when it goes down, automatically sending out an order to the supplier. But if you think about it, that's not fantastic. Because the order will arrive with the supplier somewhat out of the blue. It'll rather surprise the supplier that suddenly an order has, has, has arrived. 
and the supplier might have to start manufacturing stock. Uh, at the very least, the supplier will have to start you know, putting the goods into a lorry uh, and arranging it to be sent to the supermarket. Why don't we get the supplier to monitor the inventory at the supermarket? So if we have here the supplier monitor stop. So all the suppliers are given access to the supermarket's inventory system. They keep an eye on their inventory and when they see it coming down they could anticipate gosh in two days it's going to be out of stock I will begin now thinking about manufacturing goods or arranging delivery uh, so that when it goes down to the order level effectively the inventory is instantly replenished so there we have by, by, by changing who was doing the work who was doing the monitoring uh, we were probably going to get much more efficient inventory management. And finally, this business process re-engineering. This is a very radical uh, uh, change. There is no hard and fast difference uh, here. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the change, the, the common example which is talked about uh, in terms of business process re-engineering uh, was Ford Motor Company. And it's Ford Motor Company, their headquarters in Detroit and Michigan. And uh, there they had a very large manufacturing plant. And they had a lot of people in what they called their accounts payable. And accounts payable would be looking after, well, we'll have basically they had the purchase orders. And then we had the goods receive note, which said it can be attached there. Then they would wait. And then in would come the invoice. And when the invoice came in, they would make sure the, the, uh, the prices were correct, they would make sure the invoice agreed with the goods receive note, they make sure the goods receive note agreed with the order and so on. There were lots and lots of matching and, and, and kind of checking when the invoice came in, then you would credit it to the payables ledger and, and, and so on. And uh, at one stage there were about 400 people uh, employed in the accounts payable uh, department. And then someone had a bright idea, they said why do we need invoices? And they said to the suppliers, don't send us invoices. And they said, we know we've got the goods, and we know we've ordered the goods, and 30 days, and we know we want to spend on those goods, what we're going to pay for those goods, we know the agreed purchase price. 30 days after we get the goods, we'll pay you. And we don't need an invoice. And effectively what this did was to reduce the number of people employed there from 400 down to about 40. Simply it, it got rid of all this kind of paper chasing and matching and so on. Now you couldn't do that in every economy. You, you, you couldn't do it in Europe because we all sorts of you know, VAT implications and so on. But, but it worked fine for them. How do we find uh, how best to change? What are the uh, uh, redesign patterns as they're called here and the first one the, the, really the most radical here this business process re-engineering uh, we've suggested here you've got uh, a zero based approach and really what a zero based approach is saying knowing what we know now knowing how large we are how many deliveries we get how many deliveries out we get how many countries we operate and uh, if we were to start again, almost have our life over again, knowing where we're going to end up, how would I organize my business? Where would I put the factory? Uh, where would I put the warehouses? Would I have several factories in different countries or would I have it all centralized and so on? So a zero based approach is, is really, is almost a vision of the promised land. It's almost saying in a perfect world, how would I like this business to be organized? That doesn't mean you can easily uh, change from, from the perhaps a bit of a shambles you're in now to this kind of perfect structure, but it gives you a direction to go in. Secondly, uh, simplification. Eliminate duplication and redundant uh, steps. So that was, I suppose, what the Ford Motor Company did. 
uh, it said, do we really need uh, uh, to be to be getting invoices, looking up the selling prices, making sure the invoices and so on are at the uh, the right amounts? Do I need to move goods between various departments and so on? Because every time you move goods around or send information around, really the two people being involved, the sender and the receiver. Third, value added analysis. Is there any way we could change the product uh, that would make it cheaper to manufacture, uh, but which wouldn't hurt the, the, the final product and what customers think of it? Uh, and one of the uh, non value adding activities here is uh, inventory. So, just in time inventory, uh, we as consumers don't really care very much about whether or not raw materials or finished goods come, you know, are in a warehouse. Uh, what we want is quick delivery. Uh, and and the, the company holding vast amounts of inventory is not necessarily something which we're willing to pay for. And finally, gaps and disconnects. We're really looking for poor coordination here. Uh, would perhaps uh, supplying uh, another department with a little bit more information would that make us run rather more efficiently? The McKinsey 7S model uh, says that uh, when you are considering business structures and indeed process change, there are seven things to be uh, considered. Uh, the ones in blue, uh, the three at the top uh, uh, here, are known as the hard S's. Uh, the yellow ones, and indeed the one in the middle, the shared values, are known as the soft S's. And it says, so they say, that the hard S's are relatively easy to pin down, to write down, to capture, if you like, whereas the soft S's are rather more, more difficult to actually define. I, I don't think you need to worry about it too much. Just take it as a bit of a checklist. You have to think, for good performance, uh, do I have the structure of the company correct? Should we perhaps move to divisional structure? You have to think about systems. This could be IT systems, it could be accounting systems. Uh, do the systems uh, produce an efficiency? Do, do they carry out the sort of processing that we actually require? Uh, the style is really the style of uh, management. Uh, if you have a, an organization where really there's not very much change going on, uh, not very much development in technology, then the style and management that can be adopted, almost the culture that can be adopted, is one where the manager is really quite strict. You just tell people, just get on with that. It's not going to change for the next two years. Just keep your head down and do it. Uh, whereas in an organization where there is a lot of change in competition, a lot of changes in technology, the style probably has to be much more participative because you have to ask other people in the organization who may be experts, how do you think we could best compete with this product that a competitor is bringing out? Staff. How many staff? What sort of staff? What sort of training are we going to provide for these people? Skills. What skills do they need? Uh, strategy, what's our overall strategy? Is it going to be one where we're going to go cost leadership? Is it one where we're going to be uh, uh, differentiation? And not every business has got a free choice there. If you're a small business, then it's probably inappropriate to try for a strategy which is cost leader based because small businesses find it very hard to get costs down. And if you can't get your costs down and, and you can't get your selling price up because you're selling ordinary products, uh, your performance is going to be miserable, making this horrid little profit. Whereas differentiation might be the right strategy for a small business. You can raise your selling price, you can focus your efforts on a specialist niche of the market, and you can probably do much better. And then in the middle, uh, hardest of all perhaps to define is the shared values. Almost what is the the, 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 the core culture of the organization, is it properly based on uh, committed to giving really good customer service? Uh, and, and you know when you go into different shops, for example, or perhaps uh, approach different uh, computer manufacturers, that they've got quite different 
shared values. If you go into an Apple store uh, and you have all of these these um, people in kind of uh, uh, t-shirts willing to uh, give you expert advice and so on there, these people are convinced that Apple is the best company in the world, it's hardware and software is best and, and, and so on. They really believe that. And uh, this could be, again could be very important in performance management. Uh, if your employees don't really believe that you're a very good company, it's very hard to motivate them. Uh, they are not going to be as convinced that selling something to you is going to be the right thing to do. The value chain. This uh, should be familiar to, to you from uh, P3 and perhaps other areas here. Can very, very quickly, uh, what's it about? Uh, what uh, Borders value chain sets out uh, are basically all the activities which are carried on in the business. And the two sets, there's along the bottom here, there's what's called a primary. Primary activities is inbound logistics. This is physically how you get the goods really to the production stage. So it could be the supplier which sends them to you. Uh, and then you have to decide, am I going to keep them in a warehouse? Are they going to go straight onto the production line and so on? It could be that you go out and collect the goods and, and so on. Uh, there are all sorts of different ways in which you get goods in and you're looking for the, the most appropriate and efficient way of doing it. Operations, how are we going to organize our operations? One factory, two factory, three factories, what degree of automation do we require within that? Outbound logistics, are we going to have, for example, our own delivery vehicles or are we going to get a logistics company to do it? Uh, are we going to have one warehouse centrally or are we going to have several warehouses uh, over the country or throughout the world? Uh, are we going to send stuff by uh, uh, rail? or air, uh, uh, what's the best way of getting the goods from production to the customer? Then we have marketing and sales. Uh, how are we going to uh, ensure that uh, customers, first of all, know about us or potential customers know about us? How do they know about the, uh, the, the new products and so on? How are we going to keep in touch with these people? Service. Service can be a important revenue earning activity. Uh, service is anything which is sold after the main product, and this could be installation of machinery, it could be training of the operatives, it could be maintenance, and it could be supplying consumables. And all of these can be profit earning opportunities. But still we have to decide if we are going to uh, offer repairs and maintenance to people who have bought one of our machines, are we going to have our own engineering staff going out? Are we going to subcontract this to perhaps a, a national or international firm uh, who has got lots of kind of local people scattered throughout the world? The four going across the top uh, uh, here, these are usually called the support activities. These are more like uh, fixed overhead type activities. Uh, we have to think of the firm infrastructure uh, where is the head office going to be? How are we going to, 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 to structure IT, accounting, and so on? Do we want separate accounting departments for separate divisions, or is it all going to be centralized? Technology development is basically research and development, uh, developing new products and new processes. Human resource management, which is re really going to be recruiting people, training people, motivating people, appraising people, and motivating, I think I said motivating people, how are we going to, to, to ensure we have the right people properly trained, properly motivated uh, to, to perform the work that we need? And finally, procurement. Procurement is the act of placing orders. Uh, I've never been quite sure why procurement is regarded as a, a kind of support activity, Whereas sales and marketing, which is kind of the other side of it, is regarded as a, a primary activity, but, but no matter. Uh, how are we going to find suppliers, really, uh, to supply the raw materials? And then we're going to place the orders and so on. All of these activities which are carried on 
are aimed at producing a profit or a margin. And what the value chain is really saying is we have to understand, we almost have to do a bit of almost meditation going on here. We have to say, why is it customers come to us and are willing to pay us good money for what we do? Uh, what is it that gives us the right to earn profits? Is it that uh, we produce goods much more cheaply than they could uh, they, they could do uh, because we're operating on a global scale? Uh, is it that we're producing very clever goods where we put a lot of research and development into it and they couldn't possibly copy that? Uh, is it that they pay us good money because they don't want to do what we're doing because maybe what we're doing is risky? Uh, and they're willing to pay, you know, a, a revenue to us, which is going to be above the, the cost, allowing us to produce a profit, uh, because uh, we remove from them a lot of bother, a lot of risk, and so on. But whatever it is that, that keeps customers coming back to us, this is a key to good performance. And whatever change we are putting through in the organization, we must be careful not to destroy what customers really value. So if customers come to us, uh, perhaps because we produce goods of fantastic quality, let's say the customer is something like Boeing, making aircraft, and we're making a, a, a component of the aircraft, uh, there's very little tolerance of components which are, uh, which are of inferior quality when you're making an aircraft. Fairly obviously, if we were to try to cut costs, perhaps in our operations, uh, in here, uh, by not having quite the right quality control, uh, then then Boeing is going to stop coming to us. In some other situations, uh, people come to us because the quality isn't quite so important, but they want a really low cost per unit. Uh, and and again, if we were to uh, perhaps buy more, put orders for more expensive raw materials, uh, and these more expensive raw materials eventually get incorporated into the operations, and we lose our ability to sell goods at a really low price, then those people won't come to us. So in one case, quality was important. In another case, uh, it was low cost, which was important. In, in other cases, uh, it, it might be you always have in your warehouse a vast range of, of products and you can always supply the product needed by your customer. But whatever it is that the customer treasures, the customer values, you must be sure not to mess that up. This is the secret of good performance that you can keep pleasing your customers. Here are the uh, suitable questions for chapter 5.